Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I always ask this, so please, uh, if you could silence your cell phones. Again, I always ask, and there's always that one cell phone that goes off. So <laughs> if you could please silence them, uh, just so we can avoid any interruptions. Uh, my name is Muhammad Muhammad. Uh, I'm the executive director here uh, at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Um, on behalf of our board of directors and staff, it's a, always a pleasure to welcome you all here today, uh, including everybody that's watching online. So thank you all. Uh, it's also a great honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, Monique uh, Jack, who will be speaking about her photo book, which is called uh, Reza Girls Growing Up in the Reza Strip. Uh, so Monique is a photographer and journalist, um, and she will present this uh, award-winning photo book, which again is called Reza Girls Growing Up in the Reza Strip, uh, which looks at moments of laughter, dreaming, and living for young girls in, uh, in Gaza, uh, despite all the difficulties and constraints that define their reality. Uh, exploring issues of identity and religion, uh, Gaza Girls follows the journey of young women as they attempt to defy adversity uh, and claim back the happiness that was taken away from their daily life. Uh, this project was first published in the New York Times uh, and has been syndicated in uh, Marie Claire, Italy, Vogue Italy, Panorama Italy, The Telegraph, and The Garden UK. Uh, Monique will discuss how she produced this book and the lessons learned along the way. Uh, and please, after the event, we will be selling these books, so uh, please grab a, a, a purchase a copy on your way out. Uh, and just to give a little bit of a background about Monique, she is a photojournalist based in the Middle East, uh, her work focuses on the representation of women through documentary photography and video. Uh, her multi-award winning approach to uh, journalism uh, reframes prevailing narrative and examines modern day issues misrepresented in the media. Uh, she was recently listed on Time's Lightbox list of female photographers uh, to follow from around the world. Uh, and she has worked for a variety of editorial and commercial clients while producing a diverse pr portfolio of documentary projects. Uh, much of her editorial work is focused on challenging uh, preconceived ideas of women in Islam and has published portfolios profiling Islamic fashion, uh, Muslim beauty pageants, uh, women living under ISIS, and Sufi, uh, Sufism in Georgia. Uh, uh, Monique has also been working on projects looking at the after effects of disease uh, epidemics around the world. Uh, her work on Guinea's ability to combat Ebola was published in the New York Times Magazine and exhibited in the Johns, Hop Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, she documented the decimation of maternal health in Sierra Leone uh, for the New York Times Lens Blog uh, as well as the fallout of Zika in El Salvador for the nation. Uh, so she's been very prolific in the media. Uh, she holds a BFA from New York University's uh, Tisch School of the Arts. Uh, Monique will speak for 30 to 40 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. Um, as always, we ask that you wait for the mic to come to you when we start the Q&A session. Uh, so that everybody online can also hear. And for our online audience, you can tweet your questions to at Palestine Center. Uh, without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome uh, to Monique Jack. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed, And thanks to everyone here at the Palestine Center for welcoming me. I'm just realizing this didn't quite start the way I wanted to. No, I got it. Okay. Great. Thank you. So I started going to Gaza in two, during 2012. Um, there was a war. And as a journalist, I was sent in, you know, the traditional capacities that I am usually sent to to cover 
you know, just the general things that's happening, war, such, and a couple stories. Um, this is how I've been working for most of my career before that. I went to Egypt for the Arab Spring. I also went to Libya, Afghanistan, and other countries. Um, when I got to Gaza, I realized that what was happening there wasn't, wasn't like any of the other places that I've been working. Um, one thing that I noticed in Gaza is that I never saw any photos of women. Um, all the photos I saw were of men, um, and they're often included in, included violence. You know, the only times that I saw Gaza in the news was during these war times. So I went for these images here that are, are um, during the war, but I met, sorry, I met a, a girl and I was asking her about this. And I was saying, why don't, you know, why don't I see more images of women? And she said, well, why don't you stay? Stay after the war and I'll show you what it's really like. So about, uh, I stayed for about two weeks then, and then she kind of took me around and showed me her world. And what that means is that, you'll see, uh, it's in the next image. Um, I just got to see a lot of things that weren't really covered in the media in traditional fashions. So, sorry, give us a second. So what I began to start seeing was, you know, weddings, people getting married, people kind of having these general things that I really connected with in terms of things that people saw in other, in my life. You know, we met, oh, that's, oh no. so this is, sorry, these are still just images from my first trip. Um, I talked to a lot of girls, I guess, oh, these are in kind of a funny order. Anyway. Um, talked to a lot of girls who had dreams and, you know, asked them, like, things that they want, you know, what do you want in your life? And a lot of, everyone I spoke to said, you know, that they wanted to travel here. Sorry, here's uh, the first girl that I, I really spoke to. Her name is Doa. Um, and she told me that what she really wanted to do was travel. You know, she wanted to see the world, and, and she, but she also wanted to come home. And that's something, you know, that I really connected to as a journalist. I was traveling at this time. I was living in Istanbul. And I really, you know, connected to this. You know, this is, as everyone here knows, is that, you know, Gaza is a very difficult place. But, you know, these girls, the things that they dreamt about and the things that they wanted were so, you know, so connected to the things that we all want. Um, not to say that Gaza isn't a difficult place. You know, uh, this book is kind of talking about one of the many threads in this very kind of complicated place, you know. There are all of these things that kind of exist together. Um, and what I kind of focused on was this girlhood and what is it like coming of age in a difficult place. Um, so there's lots of spaces like this that are for women and lots of cafes where they kind of felt comfortable. You know, a lot of women, you know, don't often walk too many places. You know, they take, they, you know, kind of take cars, but there is this kind of like world that I realize that they're kind of carving out for themselves. Um, this is a wedding. Weddings are uh, male and female, um, so I wasn't able to photograph inside the female wedding because, you know, you would be able to, wouldn't be able to see it. But you know, there are weddings and there are concerts and music and all these things kind of exist together. Um, I don't traditionally do lectures, so if you guys have questions, feel free to ask, and you know, we can kind of work them into the conversation. Um, I'm a little nervous. Uh, so I'll keep, I'm sorry, I'll keep going. Um, so as you guys know, I'm sorry, I don't know, you know, we're coming from different uh, angles. Gaza has a population of 1.8 million, and that's, that population is constricted in an area that's 140 square miles, which is very small. So that kind of impacts so many other things within so uh, society, particularly for women. When you're living in such a small place, you're often living with your family, and you're living with your brothers and your cousins upstairs. And that kind of makes it really difficult to figure out the woman that you want to be. You know, you don't have a lot of space to kind of create your own identity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because if you, you don't want to go out or do something, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, my, your, my brother saw you here, you know, you're not supposed to do this. So it kind of creates a very confined relationship kind of area where it's hard to kind of make mistakes 
you know, and we all did that growing up, and we all kind of tried and pushed the boundaries, but it's just, a, you know, this kind of makes it a difficult place. Other things about Gaza, like this photo, a lot of my images are taken during blackouts, you know, there's, now I think there's about two to three hours of electricity, maybe every other day if you're lucky. When I was shooting these images, it was uh, slightly better, and they had about five to six hours, but, you know, currently medical supplies are really uh, very low, critically low. Um, hospital staff have almost nothing to work with. Um, but yeah, but what I kind of, like I said, what I focus on is more about girls and coming of age. This is a girl, Yara. You'll see here throughout the show, um, for the images, I photographed her. I, I met her when she was six, and I think I stopped photographing her. I mean, the last time I met her with her, she was 12, so you'll see her at the end. So I kind of was with her through her whole adolescence. and you know, really talk to her about the things that she wanted. And, you know, she's into music and she go, is in now currently in a middle school. Um, this is a program that girls would do um, different crafts and things to kind of get them out of their shell. You know, a lot of women need different experiences to kind of work through a lot of the issues. Uh, that was like kind of a PTSD theater program. Um, as you know, there's also Christian families in Gaza. They're not a very large population. They are in the minority, but they're in Gaza. Um, this is a session on blogging. Uh, one of the things that um, a lot of the girls were interested in is telling their own stories, which you know is just a wonderful thing to kind of do. Um, so this was trying to get women to, to, to do blogging and to tell their own stories to people outside of Gaza as a way to like communicate their lives and what was going on. And that was something that I'd worked with in the book. If you'll see, um, what we did is we gave, we, I, gave diaries to a lot of the girls that I was working with and they would write down their feelings and their thoughts and like everything they were going through. Um, and it's in the back of the book. It's all anonymous, obviously, because a lot of the things, you know, you know that women can't talk about, like, friendship and also boyfriends and love and what does that mean and the things that they want. Um, so it's in the back of the book because I really wanted to allow them to tell their own stories. This isn't my story. This is, a, you know, just a collection of images, but I wanted them to feel that they had, you know, their own agency to tell their stories. So most women don't work in Gaza. You know, it's, it's overwhelmingly... Um, has an overwhelmingly high level of unemployment, but one of the women there, Madeline, was a, she would drive a boat uh, because she was the only person in her family that could support themselves. Um, so, you know, this is also kind of a story about people who, despite their adversity, kind of find a way to break through and to find happiness. This is Saba, so she's a surfer and she would get up every morning and surf before school. Now, she, in Gaza, you're only allowed to kind of do things like this until puberty. So about two to three years after I took this photo, um, her family asked her not to surf anymore because it's not considered proper or right. Um, I met her last summer. She's married and she has a baby. And I asked her if you know, her child uh, would surf and she was like yes absolutely I'm very excited but there are all these kind of constraints that are really hard to explain to kind of the outside world where you can do almost anything you want in Gaza if you're under 13 or 14 and after that you know you have to become a woman you have these restrictions placed on you by your family and your community about what is good and what's proper a lot of girls that don't cover head their hair will later cover that when they're about that age but then you also see women who or uncover when they're older and things like this. This is in a women's prison. Um, a lot of the women in prison were over there overwhelmingly for uh, love crimes. Either they cheat on their husband or they, you know, kind of just fell into kind of a relationship that was, they that their family didn't deem proper. So, um, this is just, yeah, like I said, it was just a very complicated place where things that you that we don't think are troublesome can kind of change the way that a girl grows up. Questions? Any? Yes. 
Yeah, she's, I mean, she was the only female surfer, so she got a lot of play in the media, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people have photographed her, and she's quite well known um, for a time. Yeah. Well, it's her family. It's her younger sister and her cousin. Mm-hmm. That's something I'm thinking about for like the next version of, of women in s similar ages and different circumstances. I do a lot of work. I was just in. Not similar ages, different circumstances. Okay. In the same, yeah, in the Middle East. Yeah. Like sometimes it's just a difference. Yeah. No, absolutely. So that's yeah. Mhm. Mm sure, absolutely. Apologies. Yes. Mhm. Mm um I live in I live in Turkey, so I've been working in the Middle East. I was just in Saudi last week. Um and uh so I've been I have been working in the Middle East. Um um but yes, you know, a lot of women do get married earlier, but some get married later. I also met lots of women who were unmarried and as you know, didn't want to get married and weren't interested in getting married um, as it's a choice, you know, for them. Um, but I also met lots of women who are excited about that opportunity and like building a family. You know, there's no one thing in a place like Gaza. There's so To adulthood. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't say marriage, no, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, that kind of period where you figure out, you know, who you want to be and what kind of woman that you, you know, what you're interested in, what you want to do. Um, is that, is that what you're, okay, great. Anyone else, anything else? Um, this is um, a soccer, this is a similar, uh, girls that play soccer, you know, are often allowed to do that until a certain age. And then, obviously, sorry, um, just to clarify, the ages are different for every family. Some families are, are more conservative and some others aren't. You know, there's no hard age where this, this kind of changes. It's a very fluid thing. Um, and different families have different, you know, ideas about that. Um, and it's also the same thing with basketball um, where there's this kind of freedom to run around and dance and do what you want. I talked to a girl and I said, you know, what, what do you, what do you miss? What do you miss about being a child? And she, you know, riding a bike and playing and things like that. But um, a lot of girls don't no longer do this when they're adult. When they're in their twenties, you know, they're not really entirely encouraged. Of course, some people do. You know, there's not any hard and fast thing. But for the majority of the population, will stop doing activities and things like that. Any, anyone? Keep going. Um, this is just one of the other activities that um, girls are, can do. Um, this is a camera club. They would, they would walk around and photograph things, um, but they were older. Um, Yes, what about thank you. Thank you for, thank you for reminding me. Um, so Gaza actually has one of the highest literacy rates in the world. It's 96%. Um, this is because in Gaza, you know, women are actually encouraged to go to school. So they're going through school and they're going through, a lot of women are also going through college. Um, it is, it's just, is the way that it is. Also a lot of the schools are quite open and while the school fees are sometimes high, a lot, most women can go through them. And, and the colleges are in Gaza? Yeah, we'll get to that, it's in a bit, but yeah, there's, um, I photographed a graduation at the University of Palestine. There's a couple public and private schools as well. Um, 
but yeah, there's, there's it's a um, sound. Um, the women I met at graduation were all engineers. Um, I spoke to a lot of women who are also into banking and things like that. I mean, the ultimate goal of going to college is to, to find a job, to help your family with, you know, financially. So a lot of gear, jobs like that were geared towards that. Um, there's also a lot of journalism, obviously, in Gaza because they need to, cre you know, tell their own stories. Um, so a lot of you know, people will go into that video. So this is um, a police graduation. Uh, this was the uh, female police force that was used, that is used to, you know, if you're getting searched or basically the female police w will only deal with female population. So they deal with a lot of domestic violence as well. Um, but yes, sorry, um, so back to diversity. Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the tracks are, uh, employment geared, but you know, there's all sorts of other things as well. And what's the unemployment? You know, it changes. I mean, I think it was last I read, it was about 65%, but I, I'm not, um, yeah, it's quite, yeah. 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 Women, yeah. Is, Women is, is not much higher. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. yeah. As you guys, most likely know all goods are, are imported into Gaza. They're taxed three times. They're taxed by the Israeli organizations. They're taxed by the PA, and they're also taxed by Hamas. So goods are actually quite uh, expensive and prohibitively for. Um, so this is a girl who is a singer. Um, uh, very few women sing in Gaza because it's, you know, there are a lot of families don't think it's quite proper, but, you know, her family really supported her. and. They allowed her to do it, and she was quite happy with it. Um, this is a female uh, women to women theater group uh, that would put on shows for women to talk to women about different issues. This one was uh, kind of based on storytelling and telling traditional stories. But um, the theater was a great way to kind of talk to women about a lot of issues that, you know, need to be discussed. Um, mental health being one of them, general health care, uh, you know, other things about working issues out with your family and things like, you know. Yep, a lot of the electricity, obviously, is a really big problem in Gaza. Um, so I was there for about five years going in and out, um, and it's definitely a situation that got worse as it, as as I went uh, through. Unfortunately, the last time I was there, there was almost no electricity. Um, some families that can afford it have generators and they have a couple extra hours. But as a whole, I wouldn't, most people can't afford generators because the gas is really ex quite expensive. Questions? Keep going. Sorry. Um, what's the next one? Um, that was a Palestinian day, um, yeah, kind of uh, celebration. Um, these were different groups that would do dance competitions, um, specifically Dabka and, and a couple, they did a couple other more modern dances, but they stayed, stayed quite traditional. The port, sorry, has anyone here been to Gaza? Yeah, all right, great. So as you guys know, the port is kind of this one place that people can go to really feel, as I was told, that some place where girls felt like they could go to kind of feel like they weren't in Gaza anymore. You know, they could look out into the sea and kind of pretend that they were somewhere else. Um, and there's also lots of activities around the port that you, know, you could see. There's sometimes art exhibitions and things when it's not being attacked. 
This is Al-Shifa. Um, yeah. All these are at Al-Shifa. This is a group of nurses uh, that were doing rounds before and in the maternity ward. Um, birth rate's quite high in Gaza. You know, families have between about six to eight children each. Um, also outside of Al-Shifa, there was, uh, this is a mural about domestic violence. Um, unfortunately, domestic violence is quite high in Gaza. Um, many say that's due to the stress of daily life, um, unfortunately. Um, but something that a lot of people are, are active about and trying to work on. And some more photos of the port. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, sure, great question, thank you. Um, one thing is that this isn't work that I did quite quickly. It took me a very long time to kind of meet these people and to access them over time. You know, these aren't subjects. They ended up being, you know, friends of mine. So I would originally meet, you know, I'd meet them and we would talk about it. You know, there was obviously a lot of questions about America. What is it like? You know, why, you know, why don't they help us? What can they do to help us? Um, in America, not their favorite country, I would say, but, you know, I also think it was an understanding of that I was, you know, a person and, not, you know, not a representative of this government, but, you know, slowly to kind of become a friend. Um, but, you know, it wasn't really positive, I would say, generally. This is um, one of the, a lot of the buildings, because it's such a small space, a lot of the buildings are high rise, so you would need an elevator to get to the top floor. Now, unfortunately, the elevators almost never work. So a lot of families who live on the top, particularly elderly, just won't be able to leave their apartments very often, um, which is a shame. Unfortunately, a lot you know, um, because uh, a lot of children don't have access to modern medicine, you know, things that we consider treatable, like cleft palate, um, um, oh gosh, club foot as well, things like that, that we, you know, don't really think about very much, often don't get treated in Gaza because there's, not only do families not have enough money, but they don't have the facilities, they don't have the, various doctors and specialists that you need for these kind of things. Um, but yeah, a lot of things like that, just like don't, unfortunately don't get seen. Um, so this is in 2014, now we're up to there. Um, when, when during the 2014 war, certain neighborhoods were like completely razed almost. And uh, this is a girl that I went back with her to her home and she showed it to me and you know it was one of the few ones standing on the street um yeah and a lot of that these areas haven't been rebuilt you know there's no access to concrete almost no access to concrete um so they just aren't getting built rebuilt It's, it's kind of a very tight family structure. So I didn't see any, I'm, of course there are, I'm sure some instances of this happening, but from what I understand that everyone I spoke to, you know, families would just take everyone in that needs, needed to help. Um, so homes actually can get quite crowded and, you know, there would be, you know, 10 to 12 people in uh, different apartments. And, this is 2014 as well, and um, a girl, a family, you know, took me back to their house to see it in uh, Sujaia, and yeah, there was there wasn't anything left. Um, I oh it's the graduation.
Um, these girls are engineers, um, one of the larger tracks um, in Palestine, because they are able to, you know, kind of get jobs and things from it. But, you know, it is obviously it's a very difficult place, but this is, it was a happy day for them, and they were really excited about graduating and about finishing school and really excited about what would happen next. Um, you know, a lot of the girls talked about maybe looking for jobs in other places. Jordan, um, Saudi also takes um, a lot of foreign workers. So, you know, for them, they really were excited about the opportunity. Um, this is one of their hats. They wore um, engineering hats instead of uh, the motor boards, um, and they all signed them. Um, so it's part of, yeah, part of their graduation thing. Any other questions? No? Okay. Keep talking. Um, yeah, so what happened is I worked on this for about five years, and then I kind of decided that, you know, to, the only way that I could really put this work together was to do a book. Um, so I started, re, you know, going back and getting stories and kind of working on that because it was just so much work. It wouldn't, you know, it was no longer a magazine piece or a newspaper. It was a newspaper story. Sorry, it was just this kind of thing that existed. She's painting her nails. Uh, before graduating. Um, yeah. Hmm. No. Yeah, um, I just felt like this piece of this place just wasn't really being talked about. Um, so I just felt like it was a really important story that wasn't really getting discussed or, or being talked about. Um, but it just became this place where I could keep coming back to. Um, you know, I had eventually I moved in with a family, like I was, you know, living there um, when I would visit. And it was just this very unique kind of story that I really attached to. Um, but, wait, hold on, oh, there's someone else that's gonna say something. Yes, um, and because I was living in Istanbul, it was easier for me to kind of come down and, and spend a week, and I'm only allowed to stay in Gaza for a week. Uh, journalists only have one-week visas from Hamas, and you're not allowed to stay any longer unless you apply for a certain visa, so I would kind of come in and come out. Um, and that's a Hamas regulation? It's the government, it's government. It's okay. No, 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 it's, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's on the Palestinian side, yeah. Absolutely. Um, oh, sorry. Nope, not asking. Yeah. 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 Please. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, completely. Um, you know, everything that these girls do, think, say, are are related, you know, to this siege. You know, the things, the access to the things they have, you know, they're not allowed to leave. You, they're not allowed to find, you know, food is restricted in terms of, like, the, what the offerings and the things that you can have. Um, um, sorry, and movement as well. You know, a lot of girls, like I said in the beginning, which really wanted to travel and were interested in moving, but for them, it just almost became an impossibility where some of them would get visas and they would just say, you know, why, why bother? Why go to Rafa? It was just the way that you would go out. Why wait there for three days for the border to be open and to wait in the sun and then maybe go out? And then also, they might not be able to get back in, which is, you know, imagine leaving your home and never being told that you can come back. Or no, there's no certainty, sorry, I should say. There's no certainty that you can get back in. And so for a lot of people, you know, that freedom of movement is so essential and so critical. Like I have uh, Palestinian friends from Gaza and Istanbul, and they don't get to go home, you know, even though they have, you know, jobs and they have like, a, you know, a relatively 
you know, normal life, they say, you know, we can't go back because we don't know if we'll get in. And if we do get in, we don't know if we'll be able to leave again. So, you know, this is just, you know, just a terrible way to kind of grow up. But, you know, these, like these girls, they, f you know, find a way and they do the best they can. Obviously, you know, like I said, there's almost no access to health care. Medicine particularly is really bad. I had a friend, I was bringing in asthma medication for a while for a girl that I knew because she had like, I got an allergy to one of them that they had. So I was like trying to get her ones that she wasn't alerted to. You know, like things like this affect you every single day on every level. You know, there's, and that's, un, there's no way around that, you know, unfortunately. Other questions? Yeah, oh, a lot. I mean, the thing about these, so these girls are all, for the most part, have never left Gaza. You know, there was a couple here and there, very rarely, I almost, I asked everyone. Um, but the mothers lived in a different generation where they were allowed to leave. One of the, um, and well, the father, the father of one of the girls, he used to be a DJ in Tel Aviv and he would leave every day and go to work and you know, play at a club, you know, he was like a, you know, not particularly conservative, and then come back because, you know, before the siege, that was allowed, you know. Almost all of southern Israel was farmed by people living in Gaza, and they would leave every day, work, and then come back. Um, you know, but this has all changed, and this is different. And this is so this generation of younger girls haven't had that access, and they haven't been able to leave at all. So, no, the mothers have stories. I mean, I spoke to a grandmother, you know, who remembers the 60s and everything that happened and all the, you know, when this, you know, terrible thing started. So, the passed down the history is just very interesting and just the way it's changed within one family. You know, you can f find families where you're every generation has a completely different relationship with travel and space and their own personal history. Everything that we've seen recently is about how you can't see, you can't return, you can't go to your f ancestral home, but their grandmothers were from there. You know, they like lived the land, also some of their parents if they're older. So some, we were in an elevator and there was a blackout, which is really scary when you're in a very high building, but you know, this is commonplace, unfortunately. How are we for time? Okay. We've got a, yeah, do you have another? Any? Oh, sorry, I thought you were sorry. Hand up. We've got a couple more minutes. Um, but anyone, any other questions? Yeah. There's still more photos to go through, so I'll. Yeah, um, many, many difficulties to think about, you know, a book like this is kind of threading that needle of, of talking about stories and stories that are really personal, but also, you know, not, um, and keeping true to that was also really important, you know, because I was really focused on these, like, girlhood and coming of age and trying not to like detract from that too much um obviously you know there's a whole nother story there's that's not true there's millions of different stories someone could tell about a place like gaza but i wanted to kind of focus on one thread yeah it, they're really exciting it's interesting you know there's something another reason sorry this is what i was going to say before another reason i really felt attached to the story because these are, gr are girls who've never been photographed. They've never been told, you know, your story is interesting, your story is valuable. And, you know, when you live in a place like Gaza, you know, that's really powerful and that has, you know, such a big impact. So the re you know, a lot of the reason I kept going back was to kind of really dig into this story and really, t and really kind of talk about this. Yeah. Yes. About Arab, 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 Arab. 
Yeah, absolutely. Another really good question. Um, a lot of people that I show this book to say they've never seen anything like it. You know, they've never seen images, like a collection of images that aren't completely about violence. You know, they're like, a lot of people will say to me, you know, this is about humanity. This is about something else, which I say, and I'm sure many of you all know that this is true. And this is, you know, there's many layers to places like this and to people who live in these places. And unfortunately, in the media, we only kind of get this one perception of either a person who's interested in violence or living in violence. And obviously, you know, that's not true. There's many, many, many different layers. You know, this is a girl who, you know, was just interested in, you know, very simple things and, you know, because she was quite young, you know, it's not this one kind of idea that we've been seeing for years and years. Um, so with this book, really just kind of try to expand the way that people think about not only obviously Palestine, but the Middle East in general and, and yeah. Anything else? I think we are almost out of time. Yeah, one of the girls is an activist. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of apathy. You know, these are girls who've been struggling their whole lives. Um, so a lot of girls uh, would tell me that they're hopeful, but you know, I'd say, oh, are you going to protest you? And they're like, mm, you know, or they weren't sure because they weren't, um, you know, not really sure if it was safe or such and you know, there's a lot of issues there, but you know, I think a lot, but also a lot of their activism, I would say, is more internal. Like they would do a lot of blogging. Twitter is is really popular with good girls. Um, just you know, different other ways of kind of getting their voices out. Um, also, uh, ga protesting in Gaza isn't really allowed um, for the most part unless it's sanctioned. Um, I went to a protest um, where women were asking for the reun reunification of the West Bank because they were ho trying to get their husbands out of jail. Um, and the protest got shut down by Hamas. Yeah, so the freedom of speech within Gaza is also curtailed quite, which is, you know, they were also very interested in my actions and who I was meeting with for a while, my first couple of trips. So there's many, like I said, many layers of like just working and This, um, I showed this picture to my pal my friend, a friend of mine from Gaza who lives in Israel, and she said, you know, I, th I love this picture because it's the most, this one, is the most Gazan thing she remembers, you know, is going to visit other families, but also just going to their living rooms and staying, staying at their home. So much of life is internal, and it's private. You know, there's a very difference between public and private, you know you don't often see girls like walking around on the street together and talking, but what they will do is they'll come to different families and, and talk there and have it just be like an internal thing. Um, because, you know, the, the way society is. Anything else? A couple more pictures, but I think we can. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Dating is interesting. Um, it's what I kind of delved into a lot is because a lot of younger girls have phones. There's a lot of things happening on Facebook. You know, there's a lot of talking and, you know, there's different ways that you can meet people. Um, a lot of them would meet uh, boys in school and then kind of text them online, but then they would need to have a formal you know, meeting with the families, you know, so it's like, it's starting as a non-traditional relationship that is converted into this traditional thing where they, you know, meet a, meet a family and have coffee and there's a certain ceremony. No, it's quite, that's quite hard um, to s be seen in public with uh, someone who you're not married to or not related to in Gaza. This, it's different in the West Bank, um, but, and also every family is different. For the most part, being seen with someone you're not related to is, is um, not done. It's not very common. Um, but then you kind of, 
example of Gaussian ingenuity is the car battery that powers a modem uh, that, uh, so when the electricity is down, they can, you know, s still surf the internet and see different things. Yeah. But yeah, so sorry. So this younger generation is kind of doing a bit of both. They're blending this old and new world um, in this kind of really interesting ways. Sorry, Mohammed, do you have a? Yeah, primarily a photographer, not a speaker. Yeah. So, you know, you get the people in the West, mm -hmm. uh, or, or the Europe, we have this, not, you know, there's a, there's a stereotype that Christmas is so, so good fun by amounts, for example, mm -hmm. that, you know, we're inviting every neighbor to our house. Right. Yes. But Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Another point of this book is really to just show, you know, the movement and the lives and the, you know, aspirations that these women have. And they're often very strong and they're extremely committed, you know, women who want to work and want to make a change. Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, this... It's, it is a very limited place, but within that space, I re feel like women really push the boundaries as much as they can. I mean, you see it a lot with, like, Gaza Sky Geeks and um, what's a Green Brick, the um, uh, the girl, Mashal, uh, I think, who's making bricks out of, um, you may have seen online, she's making bricks out of rubble. You know, just the ingenuity of living in a place like this that's so constrained, really, you see it a lot. Um, and there's all sorts of women all, uh, that run all the, almost all the NGOs are run by women, you're right, um, who speak English and are very well educated and really do want to do. Yeah, actually, the ones that uh, I've had experience with were women are the ones that come out and speak English better than we do. Like, they're the ones that are yeah. Like yeah, I mean, I think there's a certain amount of drive, you know, to kind of just p really push the boundaries. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we are driving around. Another thing with this public-private space, you know, cars are private. You know, you can control who's in your car and what happens. So a lot of interesting kind of things and fun happens there. Yeah, I think it's... But yeah, anyone else? Thank you so much for having me. Um, please let me know if you have any more questions. I'm yeah, is there, is there any more questions? Absolutely we'll happy to some answer time. So more. if anybody wants to ask any other questions. Yeah. Regarding your um, ability to get in and out, yeah, abs yeah, of that's Gaza. a big one. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that process was like? Sure. Was it difficult? Did you um, go through Egypt? Did you go through right? Absolutely. Tel Aviv or um, I'm a journalist, a so I'm lucky enough to um, I have to go through the Israeli side, so I have to apply for permission from the Israelis, and, and I get a press card, and then um, I can travel through Erez. Um, oh my gosh, but. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't just describe it as difficult. A lot of other people have different ways, but because there's a certain amount of freedom of the press to come in and out, it's not um, it's not as bad as like if someone was were to try to leave or visit a family member. That's really difficult. You know, those are when you really it's it's really unfortunate. But for me, it would just it wasn't as difficult. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. you, you didn't go for I was otherwise, yeah, I had other, unfortunately, commitments that I wasn't able to go, but I really wanted to and had a lot of colleagues there.
By the way, I like the picture of the uh, the car batteries. Yeah. Because uh, my my family's from the mostly from the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, mm -hmm. and so they have a s maybe it's probably not as bad, of course, as as Gaza, but they also have severe power outages. Yeah. So they have like a bunch of car batteries mm. hooked together. Ingenuity. And then you know during the day when there is power or whatever, they charge them, and then at night that's when. The routers still work. Routers still uh, work. I used Very to power important. my laptop through them as well. So oh, yeah. You can. So it's pretty cool. People adjust to, it's not fun, of course, but um, mm -hmm. they adjust to the challenges uh, yeah. that are there. So I'm sure you've probably seen a lot of things like that in Gaza, especially. Absolutely. One of the most creative people I've ever met, just yeah. in terms of problem solving. They really go above yeah. and beyond. Yeah. Any other questions? Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Thank you Monique.